Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Alan Kittleman. I'm the Howard County Executive, and we try to have about four town hall meetings in Howard County every year. Uh, this is actually our fourth or fifth this year. Uh, and we want, last time we did one on, uh, on health with uh, uh, Howard County General Hospital's President Steve Snowgrove and, and Dr. Rossman was there and some others. Uh, tonight we thought we would do one on public safety, and that's why we're here at the Roby Public Safety Training Center. Uh, and we have pretty much everybody who's involved in public safety in Howard County here tonight to respond to any questions or concerns that people may have in the audience. I appreciate those who have come out tonight. Uh, I know there's a lot of things you could be doing. Thank you for coming here tonight, and I appreciate that. I think what I'll do, because uh, I don't want to spend time just talking, I want to make sure I have an opportunity for you guys to give comments or questions. If we could have each of the folks who are up here uh, stand and say who they are and their department so that everybody can know who's here. We'll start with Chief Butler. Can you just stand and let people know who, who you are? And John Butler, Fire Chief of the Department. Good evening, I'm Ryan Miller, Emergency Management Director. Hi, good evening, I'm Laura Rossman, Howard County Health Department Health Officer. Hello, I'm Kim Oldham, Deputy State's Attorney, from the State's Attorney's Office in Howard County. Good evening, number one, uh, Gary Gardner, Chief of Police. Bill McMahon, the Sheriff here in Howard County. <coughs> You're going to check out one right for the department's questions. Right, and so uh, instead of having them talk about their departments, I thought it'd be better to have us just be able to respond to any comments or concerns you might have, because uh, it would take, if everyone took five minutes, we'd be half the time gone. So I was just going to open it up. We have mics on both sides here, so if anyone has a question or a comment they want to give to us, uh, we would love to have you do that. So you can go ahead and line up, and we'll, we'll bring up people as it happens, or, uh, or we can have them talk. Um, so anybody, anybody want to come forward? I'm sure somebody wants to bring up something. Turn our lights on. Now they're on, I guess. Oh, you're when you talk, yeah. Anybody? Well, the, how about if I have a question for the, for the panel? Um, I, I think the one thing that we all have been hearing a lot about is the opioid crisis and what's happening in Howard County. And I know uh, we've been getting, you know, information about how many fatalities we've had and how many overdose non-fatalities we've had. Uh, and it's certainly higher than, of course, anybody would want, but unfortunately it's even higher than last year. And so maybe we could have some folks talk about what the county is doing and what we're uh, trying to do to help that situation. Dr. Rossman, do you want to start? And then maybe sure. Gardner and, and, and Jack Cavall too and others. So thank you. Um, so yes, as uh, certainly you may read or hear about the opioid epidemic across the United States, including Maryland and including our Howard County, seem, the, the trends uh, seem to be um, not necessarily getting better. Uh, that, um, and the issue seems uh, multifaceted, if you will. Uh, Howard County, along with uh, the other jurisdictions in Maryland, um, uh, are working with the governor's office um, to develop strategies to um, um, I'm sorry mm -hmm. um, to um, to develop strategies to mitigate uh, the uh, opioid response. We in Howard County have been working <laughs> across all the agencies, including everyone sitting here and those not sitting here on, I'm going to say, four pillars. One is prevention. If we can prevent folks from getting addicted in the first place, then we're not going to see fatalities at the back end. Two, for those that already find themselves in the throes of addiction, getting them, identifying the problem and getting them into treatment and into sustained recovery over a long period of time. That's sort of two and three. Four is enforcement. You've probably heard a lot about the synthetic uh, opioids, fentanyl and carfentanyl, that seem to be uh, the reason why we're actually seeing increased deaths, at least certainly over the past two years. So how can we um, work with law enforcement, basically, you know, I'm, I'm not law enforcement, so I'm gonna say the bad guys, yeah. from getting these drugs in here, which essentially, are killing the folks using them. And um, sort of the fourth pillar, or I'm going to say overarching, is, is the use of data to really understand 
what this issue is to Howard County, where the issues are, so that we can use our precious resources in particular place, in, 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 in the right places at the right time. Um, more structurally related, um, I'm going back now about the pillars. We have been working diligently um, for the director of our, of our county executive to improve uh, the network of our treatment providers in the county, and that includes both outpatient and inpatient. And I can say over the past nine months that we've increased our outpatient providers who can offer a wide range of substance use treatment, so not one size fits all, so there's something for everyone by 50%. That's great. We continue to work on bringing residential treatment to Howard County, as some of you may be aware. We really have very limited options for residents who want residential treatment within Howard County. And we have been exploring a variety of different options, trying to figure out where would be the be best location, um, best partner to work with, with, with bringing uh, residential treatment. So that's, that's pending in the works. We are reaching out to community, we, we have reached out to virtually every community organization and member to train folks in the lock zone. To date, we have trained over 2,000 Howard County residents in recognizing an overdose situation and actually providing them with a life-saving drug called naloxone. And I believe that was offered before. Right before yeah. So uh, you, anyone actually uh, can contact the health department if you or your organization wants to be trained and sort of hot off the press or not in the press yet. Um, all Howard uh, County uh, uh, government buildings will soon be stocked with naloxone alongside uh, AEDs and other life-saving equipment so that if an overdose were to occur within one of those buildings, uh, that medication would be available. And obviously we will be training the employees of those buildings to be able to use that. What we know, again, going back to the data, is in Howard County, most of the fatalities, or all of the fatalities and overdoses, actually occur over the age of 35. So we're really trying to pinpoint where people are who are 35. 75% of folks who are misusing opioids are employed. So again, we have to sort of perhaps look in places where the ordinary, we ordinarily might not suspect an opioid user may be. Um, I don't want to use no. them all that, the time. No, I think that's really great. I, can, I was going to pass over to some other folks. Um, that about Narcan, Naloxone, um, it really is a very, it's easy to learn. Uh, I went and had, got trained a few months ago. It doesn't take that long, but it really is life-saving. I mean, it's amazing what a Narcan, Naloxone can do to help somebody revive them. And so it's really important that we all learn about that. Uh, what we have in our buildings, too, as you know, we've had the AEDs for a while. We also have bleeding control kits that are in those as well because that's another thing that you know you see all too often is when we've had these uh, terrible tragedies where someone might come in and hurt people or something a natural disaster and people a lot of times people die because they lose the blood and so we've made it very important that we have these bleeding control kits in our in our office buildings as well to help out and now we'll have the naloxone as well so i mean we're really doing the best we can to try and make that happen i know that the uh, the chief of police recently used uh, naloxone right when you were, you were, or you had some, you had an opportunity or something. I remember you told me yeah, the story about that. I'll touch on a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we have, we've had about 189 overdose, overdose cases that we've investigated, and of those, 45 have resulted in fatalities. That's the highest that we've had. When we look back over previous years, we had uh, 43 last year total in the entire year, and in 2015, 26. So you can see that trend just continues. Uh, one of the things, though, that the execs referring to with regard to Narcan and, and what Dr. Rossman talked about, about how it affects everyone across the board, uh, as young as 20, 20 or 22-year-old female in Elk Ridge, uh, and then a uh, 68-year-old man in Ellicott City, and uh, the exec was alluding to, I actually witnessed uh, that overdose uh, back uh, in the summer when I was visiting a family member at a... Uh, uh, at a rehab center in Ellicott City. When I was visiting a family member, I was there picking him up to take him to his family, and uh, a nurse yelled out, screamed for help. Uh, I went over there, and uh, there was a 
the roommate of my uh, brother-in-law uh, in a wheelchair with a needle in his arm and heroin on the counter. Uh, so this is everywhere, and unfortunately, uh, he didn't he did not survive. Uh, but it did uh, impact me in that initially our Narcan distribution was for our field officers, but as a result of that, we've now expanded that to every police officer in the uh, department, including myself and command staff. Uh, but the good thing about Narcan is that about, I think about 90% of the overdoses uh, that we've responded to, non-fatal, Narcan was administered, uh, obviously resulting in some impact to bring the person back. So it is, it is an incredible drug. The one thing about Narcan, though, that I will say, it can be a uh, double-edged sword uh, because one of the problems we also see now with Narcan is that it becomes an enabling drug for some. Uh, so right now we have, in some uh, areas, health departments push out information to the public, uh, warning people if we have a case of a bad heroin with fentanyl that we have seen some deaths, they push that information out. Uh, and in hopes of not taking it, not seeking that heroin, unfortunately sometimes they actually seek that heroin because they're getting a better high and because they now have friends that have the Narcan, uh, they can be you know, brought back, I hate to say, almost like a miracle drug. So it's a couple of things that we're battling. So for things that really are positive in saving lives, it also can result in helping to enable uh, some of these folks. So it really is critical, the intervention uh, that we are looking at, uh, trying to intervene in the police department. In every one of those cases we respond to, uh, we have information that we work with the health department uh, in trying to get them assistance referral numbers, uh, drug addiction, uh, and health department referrals for follow-up with peer counselors. So we're trying on the back end as well, even though we're enforcement oriented, we're also on the back end trying to help these folks uh, because we're all in this uh, fight. Uh, as you know, every one of us up here are partners in trying to combat this problem. We're not going to arrest our way out of it, uh, although sometimes that becomes necessary. We just had a case we reported on uh, today in which uh, six people were arrested uh, connected to Baltimore, someone bringing heroin from Baltimore and selling it in Columbia. Uh, we made those arrests. And there have been several cases that we're continuing to do that. Uh, it is a constant battle, but uh, one that we're going to keep up the fight. Thank you very much. And the reason I wanted to bring up that personal story is that some people think, well, I don't need to have Narcan or Naloxone because it's not going to happen where I am. Well, it happened somewhere he probably never thought you'd have an overdose that you'd come across somebody. So that's why it's so important for all of us to be trained and to have it available because you just never, never know. Um, I know at the Department of Corrections you guys are working uh, to help people who have substance abuse disorder. Can you talk about what you're doing there, Jack? So good evening again, everybody. And I think it's a contagious thing. I know Gary's sick and so am I, so. I apologize. And more is not feeling great. Either, so yeah. so the, the sheriff is about to hightail it out of here. <laughs> All right. So we are faced with a significant number of our population have addictions histories. What we're seeing in the county, and I, I just want to touch on this yeah. briefly, is I just got the stats yesterday on the percent of our population on psychotropic meds, which means the mental health issue is becoming, it's going up 20 percent <clears throat> in the last year and a half. We've gone from 30 some percent, 35 percent of our inmates on psychotropics to 55. Often what we see is a lot of people coming in self-medicating. And so we've got a tremendous um, issue with both substance abuse and mental health. So we're fortunate, now we have great partners in the health department. So we've had, in our department, Bureau of Addiction staff do an actual drug treatment. The issue with that is it's six months of programming. So we have inmates that come in anywhere from a day all the way up to, in some cases, a couple years. If you get into the drug treatment program, you've got to be there at least six months, and you've got to be sentenced in court order to get substance abuse treatment. So we needed to, to deal with that. <clears throat> and so a couple of initiatives. The first is we expanded our self-help groups. We've added NA and NA. And that means people can go to those groups 
even if they're not court ordered to go to the treatment program, the six month program. Second is that we were, you talk about sort of like the, the stars aligning. Well, we had been in discussion with the health department and our own staff about how do we address the rest of the population that's not getting treatment? So if you look at the jail and you take a snapshot, half are sentenced, half pretrial. The pretrial people that haven't been sentenced yet, they haven't gone to court, they're not getting the treatment. So we, we start looking at how do we impact that? If that's 50 to 60% of the people not getting treatment, what do we do? We even had a discussion with the state's attorney's office about how do we get to those people to start getting them in treatment. Working with them, and Brian's here from the state's attorney's office and, and also from here. And they've been very open about, let's have some discussion about what do you plan to do with those people? Are they people that you think are going off to the state correction system? And if so, we'll take a pass. We'll wait and let them get treatment later. But if we think they're going to get short sentencing, then we're starting to look at treatment. At the same time, we're looking at this to expand capacity in the program that we have. We got approached by the state health department with the Mosaic Group, and they have this program called ESPERT, and it's an acronym, and it stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. So what is that? It's a program used in a lot of hospitals, in a lot of other settings, where if I come into the hospital and I've got an accident, but they start to screen me and they say, well, how'd you have the accidents? Were you under the influence? And they get more information and they find out, oh, you know what, you had that accident because you're under the influence. Well, then what happens? They start to engage them and they actually do a full screening and they try to do some intervention to see if they're ready for treatment. We're going to do the same thing in the jail. We're going to engage everybody. 3,000 people coming in our front door are going to get screened, and they're not going to get screened once. They're going to get screened multiple times. So what happens, what the research tells us, is that first time I might tell you, nah, I ain't got a problem. I'm good. Second time, they start to maybe think about it a little bit more, and the research that we were told says it's usually about the third or fourth time that you actually engage them. So we're, we're going to train our intake officers our medical staff, everybody gets seen by our correction officers. We have Lorenzo Williams, one of our officers, with us tonight. Lorenzo will tell you, everybody coming in gets screened. We've added these addictions questions, and in the near future, not only is he going to be asking questions about, you know, do you have any serious medical issues, but he'll start asking a lot of questions about their addiction or their substance use. Then what happens is, by contract, everybody that gets um, processed in within four hours gets seen by medical staff. All of our nurses are being trained on motivational interviewing to, to help get that information out. Then if they get committed and stay, we'll get and our, our case managers will screen them a third time. And then if they stay again at the follow-up team interview that we have a multidisciplinary team, they'll get screened again. So you're seeing that we're going to reach out and try to get information and get people engaged early. Now the big issue is suppose somebody says, yep, I'm ready for treatment and um, we find out they're going to court in 30 days and Brian says, you know what, uh, we're probably going to give them 30 or 60 days. Well, what we had to do is increase our capacity with community providers. So with the help of the health department, we're getting information and we literally have addictions providers, substance abuse providers coming into our detention center and starting to engage people right in the jail so that when they get out, it's not like, well, we're down the street. They have an appointment. They know who they're going to see and there's follow-up. So we're building that. We're also looking at, we, we hired a coordinator. He's also going to start running groups separate from what the health department's doing. So we're trying to build the capacity to capture more people and engage them. Um, on another front, what we're doing is a lot of people, when they get out, they, they start off well. One thing about addiction, relapse is almost expected. So one of the things that we're working on is with our Division of Parole and Probation partners, 
is when people relapse, can we get them quickly into treatment and try to prevent them going off what I call the deep end, where we've had a lot of people in the past, they start using, they stop reporting, and then it just spirals. Well, we have reentry case managers that are actually going to work with or actually are working with parole and probation agents, and as soon as they see that positive urinalysis, they're starting to do that engagement and referral to treatment. So what are you doing then? You're enhancing public safety by doing that. And we've got a lot of cases where we've stopped that sort of spiraling out of control, gotten them into treatment. The biggest challenge is, I've talked to the exec about this, we often have people that say, I'm ready for treatment, get me there, we take them, we get them assessed, and then what happens? we got a bed for you, but it's in four or five days. And I think one of the big initiatives that I know the county's working on is to try to fill that gap to get those beds so that it happens today. And I'm going to share a personal story. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but and it, this is where I found out, I thought I knew a lot, but I found out I didn't know as much as I thought. So I have a son that's um, 26, about well, 27, excuse me, just just turned 27. I guess I should know the age of my kids. <laughs> but what happened is he went to parochial school, grade school, and then he went to Mount St. Joe. And he had a, a good friend of his that I used to coach him in CYO basketball. Good kid. Goes to uh, parochial school, goes to Mount St. Joe, graduates, goes off to college. My son goes to Salisbury, and he went to Anne Arundel Community College. And they sort of disconnected. But they still talk. I knew he had sort of started to stray away from maybe what he should be doing, but I never thought I would get the information that I got about a year ago this time. My wife and I were home. My wife was real close to him. She calls him her adopted son. What happens is he, he, he sends her a text and says, I'm in trouble. And he said, can you get Mr. Jack to help me? I don't know what to do. And I thought, oh crap, he's locked up. <laughs> you know, what am I got? I can't bail him out. We we get a hold of him, and what he says is, I'm a heroin addict, and I'm I've been I've lost my job, I've lost my car, i I can't go home, my girlfriend's kicked me out, I'm living on the street now. We got him, we got him to the health department. Chris Collins, our addictions counselor, immediately said he needs inpatient treatment. But guess what happened? It's a Thursday, they tell us we'll get the bed on Tuesday. Now I got a heroin addict with me, and he's got to wait till Tuesday. And he, and he tells me, he says, oh, I'm gonna, he said, you, you're gonna have a problem. He said, because I'm gonna book out of your house, and I'm gonna go down to, he told me where he goes to cop his drugs. And I guess I'm gonna tell him myself, but basically, correctional staff have handcuffs. So he wound up handcuffed to my basement bed. Wow. And my wife's a nurse. And she helped him through all that. The moral of that story is, you can't tell an addict, you gotta wait four days to get to a bed. We gotta change that. And that's the one thing that I think we've recognized that that's gotta change. If you have a um, hypertension issue or a heart condition or whatever it might be, and it, it's critical, does the doctor say, you know what, I got this great cardiologist, um, and you need urgent care, but I'm going to send you there five days from now. We've got to think of it differently. And I think we're starting to get there, and I think we realize it. But it really hit home when I had to see that first hit and him go through withdrawal. And it was not like, you know, rapid. It took about the third day, I was about ready to uncuff him and let him go. Um, and that's not, you know, and that's not something that people ought to do. And that's something we have to look at. So I just wanted to bring that up because that's real. That, that hit whom? Nobody can tell me, oh, it's easy, you can go get treatment, and it's like that. It's difficult, it is getting better. The health department has been great. I get an update, I'd say probably about every week and a half of, here's the new providers we've brought in. And that really has helped us. At one point, we used to have really difficult time, even in intensive outpatient treatment, connecting people up. But what has happened is we're getting people into in outpatient treatment much faster. The inpatient thing, still an issue. I told the exact story. We had a young lady that got out on a Friday, had a bed waiting for Monday. She overdosed over the weekend. 
that's the that's the the I guess that hurdle we've got to get over. And I, I know they're probably we're going to talk a little bit about the plans to help address that. We're working at it, um, but those are real things. But the people that do get out, <clears throat> I think it's really critical that we sort of plan for relapse and then have a response for it, and the response has to be quick, not later. So. Thank you, Jack. And when he says that that young woman overdosed, she overdosed and died uh, because we didn't have a bed. That's got to change. And uh, I know that Mara and others in our administration are working to, to find a way to get those beds. And we're, I, can, I think I can honestly tell you that she and other folks in my administration are not letting any stone go unturned to try to find a place and a location for us to be able to do that because it's just really not right. You know, there's a lot of times people think Howard County, this Nirvana place, that is the greatest place to live in the world, and it is. Uh, but we have problems too, and we can't assume that we're going to have to send all our folks who have these problems to another place. Uh, we need to have those places here in Howard County. And, uh, and that'll be something we need the community to get behind. Because if, as soon as we start talking about, it, oh yeah, I want, you, I want to have one of those, but don't put it near me. And so we have to work together as a community to figure out how we can make that happen. And we're doing as much as we can right now, and we'll let you know more as we find out about that. Um, I know the state's attorney was, was mentioned. I don't know if, Kim, you want to talk about what the state's attorney's been yes. doing? Yes, thank yeah. you. Well, it's appropriate that this is the first topic that is mentioned for tonight because just before I came here, I was at the graduation ceremony for the DUI Drug Court in Howard County District Court, which is one of about 50 in the state of Maryland um, that's really geared towards rehabilitation. So the state's attorney's office, as you know, is the prosecuting office for Howard County. And most people think that the only thing that prosecutors are concerned with is accountability and punishment. That is one of the things that we certainly take into consideration and uh, have as a goal in mind for particular cases, but we also have to take into consideration rehabilitation. And we have a prosecutor that is strictly devoted to drug court and drug court cases. So for those individuals who are eligible, that have cases in district court that are for nonviolent offenses, if they're eligible and accepted into this drug court program, that prosecutor stays with them from start to finish, and hopefully that finish is at the graduation ceremony like we had this evening. Um, it's, it, there was a full courtroom of supporters there for these graduates. It's a very team-oriented approach, and the goal is to get at the root of the problem for these addicts and hopefully lessen the recidivism rate for these uh, misdemeanor-type crimes that are being committed in the community. So that's one aspect of how we address rehabilitation. Um, Mr. Cavanaugh had mentioned working with our office and trying to fashion appropriate sentences and how we can get people assistance while they are awaiting trial. Uh, we've also had the chief of our district court division, Brian Furlong, that Mr. Cavanaugh mentioned. He had a discussion with our district court judges about that one of those problems, which is how about those people that haven't been, that are being sentenced, but they're being sentenced to very um, small, periods of incarceration because their crime is a trivial one. They're not getting six months, they're not getting 12 months, they're not getting that amount of time that allows the uh, detention center's program to accept them. What can we do with those people? And what we did was we talked to the district court judges about the prosecutors, even for first time offenders, if it's a trivial crime but the root of that crime is a drug addiction, that we were gonna ask for a period of incarceration that would at least give the detention center enough time to have a plan set up for this person. So that even if they were there for just a few weeks, once they're given their good time credits uh, for their sentence, even if it's just a few weeks to allow someone at the detention center to work with them and get them set up with a plan, if that person is willing and ready to take action and try to battle that addiction, then it would at least give the detention center an opportunity to work with them and get them set up so they have a place to go to once they walk out of the detention center facility. So those are some of the things that we um, incorporate into our handling of cases that involve individuals with drug addictions. For those individuals that are involved in the actual dealing and importation of those drugs, I would I'll certainly refer to as the more serious offenders, the drug traffickers in Howard County, and we do have them. We have a drug unit in our office similar to the Howard County Police Department having a very specialized unit. And those two units in our office and the police department work together. We work together early on in those complex investigations that involve people actually 
bringing heroin and cocaine from California and beyond into Howard County, believe it or not. And for example, the um, arrest that Chief Gardner mentioned earlier that was announced today, one of those individuals was already pending a case in Howard County for felony drug distribution. That person was actually found guilty this week in that particular case, and when he's sentenced in January, our office will be asking for a period of incarceration of 20 years. Um, and, and this is somebody that now has another case of felony drug distribution in Howard County, as announced by the Howard County Police Department. So for those individuals that are charged with actually trafficking those drugs into Howard County that then trickle down onto the streets and then poison those addicts, we do aggressively prosecute them. And our primary concern for those individuals is accountability and punishment. Outside of rehabilitation and punishment, our office is trying to expand a little bit more in uh, what role we can play in education and perhaps early intervention. Uh, we would love to get a program <laughs> together to go into the schools and talk to high schoolers and perhaps even middle schoolers about being cautious about drug use. Not necessarily to scare them, but just to be cautious so that they know that you know, they don't always know what they're taking if they want to try something for the first time. They don't know if something is laced with fentanyl that they're trying for the first time. I heard this crazy story about something that goes on sometimes at high school parties about where a candy bowl is put in the center of a coffee table and everyone dumps into this candy bowl whatever types of pills they could get their hands on either from their house or from somebody else on the street and then it's a free for all and everyone takes turns taking something out of that candy dish. So, you know, we think that students need to be aware of these dangers. Um, I did participate in a panel presentation at Wild Lake High School last winter, and that panel presentation was exactly that type of theme. Um, there was a police lieutenant there, there was a parent who had lost a child to an overdose, but that theme was just, you know, you have to be careful. It's not just a one-time thing. You never know what you're taking. Um, it was very powerful. There were actually some students that came up to us afterwards and said it would be great if you could do this for every class. It would be great if you could do this for even kids that are younger than us because you know what? The drugs were available in middle school. So we would love to have our office uh, participate more in the community with programs like that so that we could help with the education of the dangers of these drugs. Great. Thank you very much. So, I, don't, I mean, we're taking a lot of time. Hopefully people have thought about other questions they might want. Does anyone else, I don't know if Chief or, or if Ryan or Sheriff wants anything? I just want to um, circle back to kind of where we started with Dr. Rossman making a statement and it being manifested with regard to uh, the multifaceted approach uh, to uh, opioids and, and, and heroin and other uh, drugs. Narcan, um, uh, Chief Gardner said we're not going to arrest our way out of this and I'm almost remiss if I don't say we're not going to Narcan our way out of this. Okay, we got to do a, a little deeper dive. Um, and I don't want to oversell Narcan. Narcan is fitting to be in the AED cabinet. The AED, the AED buys you time. It doesn't fix the diseased heart. And Narcan buys us time. It buys us time if the person's breathing less than eight to 10 breaths per minute. But what happens before that? You know, I, I, I don't want to oversell Narcan or undersell it, but just put things in perspective. We, we collectively as a society would have to dive much deeper than, than Narcan. And that's all, that's all I wanted to say about that. Yeah, thanks. I don't know, Brian, if you want to say anything. Sure. Just real uh, briefly, my name is Ryan Miller. I'm the Emergency Management Director. Uh, so our role uh, in Howard County is largely a one of coordination. Uh, so when the governor declared a state of emergency on March 1st, uh, that was what we were asked to do as local emergency management directors was to come alongside of our health officers. Uh, so in our case, I get to work with Dr. Rossman, who uh, we've been through a lot of things together, uh, natural hazards and such over the years. So um, we came alongside and, and largely just came up, uh, uh, brought a sort of a, a resource um, uh, role as well as some process uh, and then also um, look for other resources in the community that we could bring to bear. I can I could tell you um, when the announcement was made, I came to Dr. Rossman and said, okay, well, uh, you know, we're kind of experts in natural disasters. I don't know much about this. Who do you, who do you recommend we go talk to? And she gave us a list uh, and she said, well, you should probably, in order to bring, up, bring you up to speed, you should go to talk to these other folks here. Uh, and I was just really blown away by 
how long of a trail she sent us on, honestly. <laughs> you know, by the time we got back, it was like a dozen or so different entities in the community. So I just want to point out that, um, that the, the list of entities that really is at work on this is extensive uh, and one that I didn't fully appreciate uh, fully until, uh, until the declaration. And that declaration of emergency is still in effect today. Uh, now come, coming up on a full year after March 1st. So, thank you. I don't know, Sheriff, you okay, can you take a question first? Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Um, the talk about the, uh, the overdose, I, I had a, actually had a, a cousin that overdosed uh, on the fentanyl. Is there any programs that are out for the children? Because I know a lot of these, uh, the folks who are dying or, or a lot of the households who are being affected with the drug abuse, there's children in their household and there's grandparents raising children. But are there programs out there that we would be able to refer families to? So like for early um, second generation prevention. Good, good question. Can Mark, you address that? So that's a great question. Um, so there is one program that's actually in the community strengthening families. Um, and I'm going to say that is that DCRS that's run out of the Department of Community Resources. I know they have slots. It's a very intensive program designed for children at risk for drug abuse by having a family member. It doesn't necessarily have to be a parent. It could be a sibling. It could be a grandparent who um, are substance users. It's very intensive um, and evidence-based program. So we could get you information on that. Okay, and then the other uh, thing I have, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I, 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 understand, I see the website that Howard County has put out, and I guess you guys are telling folks when there's a bad batch of heroin and also <laughs> the number of deaths. Um, and one of the things I know in that situation is that his mom was told that when he started go going into a crisis, I guess there's this myth, I don't know if it's true, to put the person in, in ice cold water. Is there a way that when you put out your information that you could probably tell them if you don't have Narcan or whatever the thing is, is to call 911 is the best thing to do? Because we're hearing a lot of deaths for, uh, where teens are, are uh, going to a crisis of drug overdose and they're just like being left at hospitals to die and no one's calling for help, I guess out of fear that they're gonna be in some type of trouble or because there's drugs involved. So maybe if we let them know this is what you should do and what you should not do. Okay, thank you. Anybody wants to respond to that? Well, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll comment about the, uh, the concern that people may have about getting in trouble. In 2015, uh, the General Assembly passed a Good Samaritan law that uh, protects people who report someone who's having a medical emergency in crisis. So if that person uh, themselves call for help or another person there who sees the medical emergency, the Good Samaritan law protects them from any type of criminal charges uh, for making that report. The goal is, because you are correct, years ago we would actually have people drop individuals off in a parking lot, leave them in an apartment building, leave them in a car uh, because they didn't want to get in trouble uh, for having the heroin with them. But the Good Samaritan law protects them. We push that out periodically on our social media. And I think some other sites, uh, the health department does periodically as well. We're trying to get that message out. And I do think it is getting out because we're getting more and more people now reporting that to us on a regular basis. Thank you very much for your comments. One thing I thought we also should talk about is if somebody knows someone who is in crisis, what should they do? Um, I know that we, we work with grassroots now. Is that, can someone talk about the relationship we have with grassroots? I don't know if Mar, you or Brian. Yeah. So. So um, the, uh, from uh, uh, the governor and the uh, opioid, I'm not feeling well either. So like my yeah. brain is like half working. So Sorry. when I'm pausing, it's trying to like get the next word, Maura. Mm -hmm. uh, so from the, the, um, the governor's budget allotted um, uh, a certain specific amounts of money to each jurisdiction. Howard, got, Howard <coughs> County received $124,000. Uh, what you just heard is here one of our gaps in Howard County is what I'm going to call a crisis or on-demand treatment. Somebody who's in crisis, how do we get them to the right place immediately? Um, so we are using that money um, to uh, develop uh, substance use crisis services through our grassroots, who historically, I'm sure most of you know, has, is our crisis service developed initially uh, for um, suicide prevention. Um, 
but as I think somebody alluded to here, it's it really it's not uh, it should be it's not a mystery that co-occurring mental health issues and substance use. I mean, it's more than 75 percent. So to only treat someone for mental health or substance use, you're really missing the other half of, of the problem. So uh, we will have uh, uh, the ability for someone to walk in to grassroots uh, for an assessment and a referral to treatment. During regular business hours, someone can contact the health department, behavioral health unit, and ask for assistance, be it themselves, family member, friend, and you can actually also walk into the health department between the hours of 8 to 5 on regular business hours. So there are resources out there, and we are trying to do our best in making sure that that information is, is getting out. I just want to make sure everyone knew there is services available. Just make sure to know how they can get those. Um, you know, we, we have a, a sheriff in Howard County that was previously our police chief. So we're very fortunate with that. I don't know if there's anything you want to add with this, Sheriff. There's no, I, I, I'm just dovetailing. I want to thank, you know, so a lot of people don't know what the role of the sheriff is in Howard County. We, we certainly have um, a role in, in providing for safety and security of the courthouse. And so there's all types of people that come into there, you know, some for trials, advocates. Um, so, but then we also have a, a portion of our personnel that are out in the field um, serving warrants, serving protective orders in domestic violence cases, doing evictions, things like that. Um, so we have trained, uh, thanks to the fire department, the health department, the police department, we've been able to train all of our deputies in the administration of Narcan. And we have, um, uh, in the courthouse anyway, we have already placed that drug into our AED cabinets there. So you know, we'll feel very well prepared. Uh, we, we just needed to be prepared. And I would agree with Chief Butler. I mean, it's not a panacea. I mean, just buying people's time, buying time for people to get help that they need. You know, I think we all have these personal stories. And it, it's funny, in, in my 30 years in law enforcement, you see when it comes to issues of crime, and it, sometimes people line up with different philosophies about whether it's treatment, whether it's different. This issue, this issue of opiate, over, uh, opiate, opiate overdoses and, and deaths, you're seeing people from all walks of life coalesce around this issue. They, I mean, I, I can tell a personal story as well, somebody very, very close to, to me and my family that is going through this. Um, it's been amazing to watch over the last couple of years um, that this, this particular issue is affecting people regardless of race, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of where they live, regardless of what high school they went to. Um, it, 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 it's a scary, scary uh, epidemic. That, that everybody's dealing with, but um, you know, I think you do have a pretty strong team here, led by the executive and others, uh, trying to deal with it here in, in the county in, in some really creative ways, um, in getting to the source of it, so that it's not just the police department arresting people and the fire department saving people's lives. It's about getting to the root, root cause. So I think we're fortunate in that regard. Thank you, Sheriff. And, and that's one thing I wanted to impress upon everyone here tonight is that we are taking this very seriously. We want to work with everyone in the community. Uh, but I think you've seen some passion here tonight, people who really care and want to make a difference. And so uh, we urge you to continue to work with us as well. Um, again, I thank the young lady for coming up. If anyone else has some questions, feel free to come up and ask a question or comment. Sure, thank you. Um, Jeb Bateman from Columbia, thank you all for being here tonight and for the good work you do every day, in fact. Um, question not specifically related to the opioid crisis, but certainly related on some level. I have for the last couple of months been working to build a bit of a consortium of concerned citizens mostly around social media but also in person and even going door to door and as a result I've found myself subscribing to all of your various social media pages as well in an effort to get information to that group but I'm wondering if you have any other thoughts or ideas on uh, resources or outlets ways that I could gather and collect information that's specific to public safety relative to Howard County citizens who want the information. Uh, anyone has any comments on that? First of all, I want to thank you for what you're doing as a community. I mean, that's exactly what we need. We need to have people out also working in their own communities because, you know, the government can't do everything. And so I appreciate you doing that to get, kind of be a conduit to help people. But I don't know if anyone has any. I mean, uh, we have, uh, we're looking at a one-stop shop maybe a, a page that you can do a link to and have all that information uh, on one 
page to go directly to for a variety of reasons. Also, there's Howard County Drug Free. Uh, also provides some information uh, specifically oriented towards teens uh, and that uh, opioid abuse that might be helpful as well. I think it's HC Drug Free. HC Drug Free. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, let me just add: Has the group um, gained? <laughs> has the group gained some uh, training? in Narcan administrations and so only CPR? Uh, they have not yet. So uh, I've only been working this for a couple of months. It started with my homeowners association and uh, spread through King's Contrivance and now into Columbia at large and even some places in Laurel. So, but it's, again, it's, it's the, the focus is community involvement and engagement. So I have I see. Howard County Parks. I have this, the school system and I fish through all of that information every day and then pluck out the cherry sort of and provide it to the group. Um, but certainly that's something that I have, the, some of the, uh, the uh, Narcan training that you've been doing, I've been posting that for them as well to help get more folks involved. Because I'm sure, I get right saying, I'm sure that if, if, if you have groups that would want to come out, the fire department would be happy to come out and do trainings. And so we could probably figure out how we could organize that with you. Great. That'd be great. Okay, yeah, if Ryan. we could do it as a group, that would be yeah. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think Ryan was. Mr. Bateman, I'd also say um, uh, we've got some material for the Ready Hoco uh, program as well, sort of a general all county government preparedness uh, package. So we've got some materials outside that can hand to you. Uh, and then, if, yeah, we'd love to have you help retransmit uh, the message of personal and business preparedness as well. Uh, I, I have been, yeah. But Thank you. I'll, I'll check on this. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Please come, why don't you come forward so we can hear It might be related to what he was talking about, but um, my name is Phil May Anderson and I'm in the Fun Hill Neighborhood Association. So when all of these hurricanes were happening and you start seeing all these pictures on the internet, and, I mean on the TV and, and so on and so forth, uh, I, 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 was, I, was, I started to ask myself, so what if something like that had were to happen around here? I mean, of course, you know, I, I mean, nothing is impossible, so. So what happens, so I started thinking, okay, so who do I call or where do I go or how, would my, how could my community, my neighborhood, you know, have like a preparedness committee and who do we call? And so talking to my husband, he says, well, uh, sure, we have the emergency transmission thing, but what if the TV is not working? The electricity is not on. We don't have fo regular phones anymore. We have cell phones. We have older people in our community. So I actually came to this meeting because I really wanted to hear about uh, M Mr. Ryan Miller, you know, about emergency preparedness, uh, what, you know, we could, discuss it after the meeting or I can learn more about it. But I really, I am very interested in finding out what do we have in our county that, you know, that we can come up with some sort of preparedness. So. That's great. And I, I tell you, Ryan Miller is loving you right now. <laughs> <laughs> what time do they turn the lights off, sir? Oh, really? he, he, I didn't know. No, no, no. He could, he could talk to you for hours on this subject. But, um, oh, good. No, no. Good. It's a little laugh here because we joke about it about Ryan. But, um, but I think it would be great if you could talk a little bit about that now and then share with her later as well. A little bit. Absolutely. Uh, go, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. And really, it's a kind of a little inside joke, guys. I'm sorry. This is going to come off my minutes tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a little part in the executive's cabinet tomorrow. Yeah. I think I'm going to lose those minutes. Um, so thank you very much for asking that question. And, and as the executive just mentioned, we'd be, I'd be more than happy to uh, put those materials I just mentioned, Mr. Bateman, in your hands. Uh, our office, we're fortunate. The executive has um, given us staff to be able to get out and interact with the community. As I mentioned, we launched the Ready Hoco campaign this past year to now we have materials we, uh, in that packet, I believe in the lobby has a community hazard handbook. Uh, so you kind of wonder, I live in Fawn Hill, what hazards do I face? What, what hazards are even in Howard County? Um, you heard, might have heard about a little earthquake a couple weeks ago, and then people wonder, well, how, is that a little, is that little or big, or could there be another one? So uh, the community hazard handbook seeks to uh, profile the 26 most, uh, most prominent hazards that we face here in Howard County. So that's for you as a, as a resident uh, or as a business owner. Uh, so you know what you should plan for. And then likewise, 
sort of what we do as your county government, uh, we all work together continuously uh, to respond to the, the small, medium, and then large size disasters, uh, the largest of which are planned for under a thing called the Emergency Operations Plan. Uh, that's online if you'd like to see how we how we organize ourselves uh, and how different county agencies have different responsibilities during emergencies. Uh, but at the personal preparedness level, I, I just want to thank you for kind of taking the initiative in your neighborhood, honestly, and start to have that conversation with your neighbors. Uh, and we'll come behind you and give you it, all the resources you need. Uh, and if you get a group together, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was down the street from you, I was invited by one of my neighbors to uh, the, uh, a men's group at the 50 plus center uh, and spent an, probably an hour uh, talking to 35 or so uh, gentlemen about kind of hazards in Howard County and what they should be doing and sort of what we can do to resource them. So we'd love to have that conversation. Uh, if you get a group together or just, just for yourself and your family, we'll give you all the resources you possibly need. I invite need. you to the annual meeting. Okay, that would be great. Love to be there. Thank That'd be you. Great. That'd be great. Thanks for that question. Yes, yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Shayla Bateman. Um, my question is actually about um, the flip side of public safety. In other words, we can. And I don't mean to diminish the um, importance of this of this crisis and 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 the emphasis that we need to put on it, um, but that seems to be pretty far down the road, and there. Are other um, there's a flip side to that and that's the public safety and I'll be honest with you I find myself lock I live in Columbia we live in Columbia I lock the car uh, my, my car my car door every time I get in um, and that makes me uneasy I lived in New York City I lived in DC and I never locked my my doors um, when I lived there so I guess what I'm asking is in terms of law enforcement um, are you planning any deterrence and I understand that if you perhaps can't or don't want to talk about those, but um, any visible deterrence that we as citizens and residents can see um, that law, enforcement's, law enforcement is trying to put a dent in the opioid crisis on the front end uh, before it gets to prosecution, before it gets to death, and before it gets to overdose. Uh, prevention on the law enforcement front. So just if that make makes sure, sense. Just to make sure I'm going to understand, uh, are you talking about intervention as interdiction or are you talking about prevention as far as education I'm not talking about education I'm talking about whether it's you know um, increased police presence whether it's um, community programs uh, whether it's you know going into community like our like ours and um, deputizing no pun intended sir uh, people to um, to do things that can drive drive out uh, drug dealers, traffickers, and, and or maybe tip you off to things and, and create more um, safer, create safer communities, put deterrence in place that people will not want to go in, deal drugs, sell drugs, traffic drugs, go through our community. Well, actually, the public, you are our eyes and ears, and you can be the most valuable asset to us. So, you know, we have neighborhood community police officers out in most of the Columbia communities and uh, you can have a direct link if you go on our website you can connect directly to them if you have issues and problems in the community uh, but really you are our best asset out there when reporting things to us uh, we had this, this case I spoke about uh, recently that was something that was generated from the community seeing suspicious activity and reporting to the police department sometimes we can have a quick turnaround uh, and be able to intercede in that and sometimes it may take a longer period of time, uh, days, weeks, even months, sometimes in trying to build a case, because uh, not all the suspicious activity is drug related. Uh, and we just don't know that. So that takes some time. But really, if you mobilize with our uh, community outreach uh, division and go online, you go, you'll find the many neighborhood community police officers we have. We love coming out to the neighborhoods. Uh, and <coughs> talking to you about things you can do to mobilize, whether it's a community crime watch, neighborhood watch program that you can set up and establish and develop a real good network. Uh, we also have Nextdoor, uh, a social app. Do you have that? Yeah. And uh, while we learn a lot from that, if people share that with us, and that's a great way to communicate with the police department as well. I mean, we're finding social media to be the easier way uh, to communicate in a much more timely uh, fashion so we can uh, have a better response to that. Thanks. 
also in Colombia, not just Colombia, can you talk a bit about, about the bike patrol? Just because I think that's something that's also a way for people to see people in the community. Yeah, I mean, one of the things uh, that we've instituted uh, is uh, bike patrol. So we have over 100 miles of pathways uh, in the county. And so we've, we started out with decentralized, where patrol officers that work beats, you'd see the bikes on the back end of the police cars, they would get out uh, and get on those bikes for a period of time. But one of the limitations was the, really the opportunity and the time. So sometimes they get out, they're out there for 15 minutes, they have a call, they have to go back to their car. So now we, we still have that program, but we also have a permanent uh, pathway patrol program where we have officers permanently assigned to work the pathways in the county. Uh, they utilize bicycles, they utilize electric motorcycles, uh, and we just added uh, electric uh, cart to like a kind of a golf cart on steroids, if you will, uh, that now roams the uh, pathways in the county, and uh, it's proven to be very helpful. We just had a situation where uh, over in Lake Elkhorn on the pathway where we had an individual who was groping women, and uh, we were able to make a, an arrest in that case. Officers were already out there in the community and we're able to uh, stop, detain, and identify him as the uh, suspect. So it's proven to be uh, very valuable. Uh, folks see us out on the pathways all the time, but uh, it's it's a lot to cover and we hope to expand that program as well. Great. No. I know Milton Matthews is here. I know the Columbia Association Absolutely. works with us on that, so I thank him for being here as well. It's good. Um, are there any other questions or comments anyone wants to make? Feel free to go. Mr. Horowitz. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Wanted to talk about the, what you've learned from the flood while it was flooding, so not the response to it. Because sure. I was d disappointed, I guess, with the, the lack of awareness, I guess, of how much rain had come down from the watershed in, in the first hour. I've seen videos of cars driving into El Main Street, driving towards the river. Don't ever wonder whatever happened to them. Um, a lot of the roads didn't seem to be blocked off. I live in Columbia and I only found out about it because one of my neighbors on our group Facebook page said, hey, Joe, it's flooding in Ellicott City. When I went to Twitter and I, the Twitter page from the police department, on the 29th you had an elderly scam. The first and only tweet from the police department came at 11.01 that followed HOCO.gov for road closures regarding the flash flood. And I tweeted back, I said, that's your only response. If you didn't follow the police, the fire department, you wouldn't know that it was flooding in Ellicott City. The weather service was issuing warnings, I guess, that there are some issues for uh, Lake Kitimikandi and Wild Lake and, and Centennial. There was never any tweeting or acknowledgement to stay away from a lot of places, apparently. You didn't use the cable override emergency for Comcast, at least. Did you use reverse 911 in the more affected areas? So I guess part of the thing with the tweeting, you do such a great job for other incidents from the police and the fire department. It was a fire, an accident, truck fire, road closed, or the, I remember the, shortly after that, I guess was the, this is a business package on 29. They said the road is closed. Update, the road's still closed. Update, we're opening the road. But when you had the flood, the only response was after the flood had come and gone and all the damage was done and there was no more water actually. So what have you learned about getting it out to the community, acknowledging, I guess, uh, I think you've seen more of awareness of, uh, rain events for the watershed in particular, but not just for Ellicott City, but I guess, as I said, the, there was flooding in uh, Columbia as well. You didn't warn that South Entrance Road was flooding, I guess. Um, so, Great have that. you updated it? Oh, and the last thing, I guess, so on the website tonight is still, you have a 2010 list of frequently flooded roads, which does not list any of the ones in Ellicott City, because apparently not frequently flooded, and it seems you need a flood-prone road list to, uh, rather than ones that frequently flood. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for your comment. Do you want to mention something there? That was a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Um, the first, uh, so thank you for those questions. The, I think the first one you asked was, um, did, we, did we learn anything? And I think the, the answer to that is, 
we learned enough uh, to probably supply us with a decade's worth of improving our system. Um, you know, conventionally, I think um, uh, most feel like the response was was really good. Um, in fact, FEMA has highlighted the response and recovery as, uh, as, a, as a best practice, specifically the recovery. Um, but that doesn't mean that we weren't actually really hard on ourselves uh, and looking at different ways we could have improved. And that was not just our office, but all county agencies that were, uh, that were responders. In fact, we collected over 700 uh, unique improvements that, that we're going to look to build back into our system. So kind of a continuous quality improvement cycle. Um, and we just wrapped that process up of collecting that data about three months ago. So uh, in that process, one of those is the alert and warning. And um, I don't have the, the exact second stamps to give you here now, but uh, I can assure you that we went back and really analyzed uh, you know, every piece from the first moment that I was notified uh, that, uh, uh, that there was flooding uh, beginning. In fact, we were in touch with uh, the 911 center. It's run by the police department. Uh, with public works, stormwater management, uh, before there was even a, a, the first water res uh, rescue response was dispatched. We were actually already uh, in touch with them. Started as a regular kind of hot and humid Saturday evening. Uh, people are out and about doing their thing at, as well as all of us. Uh, but we quickly mobilized uh, and opened the emergency operations center within, uh, within an hour of that first water rescue. And you're asking the question about, well, you know, what, how do you not know all the different roads? Frankly, it was six and a half inches of rain in two hours. It was, you know, a, a thousand year rainstorm. Uh, and we, we frankly don't have the data on hand to really know where, uh, uh, what road was going to flood it at what time. In fact, um, we were really concerned not just about the Ellicott City watershed, but about uh, the watershed um, which you live uh, over the Fawn Hill that leads into Centennial, uh, Centennial Lake. Uh, we were actually concerned about Centennial Dam for a period of time. Uh, so there's a lot happening, uh, as you can imagine, in the operations centers. We're trying to figure out what roads are going to need to be closed, how to keep everyone out of harm's way. Uh, we actually did send uh, a flood warning message that was initiated by the National Weather Service uh, on our behalf. Uh, we sent out numerous messages also um, using the notification system. Uh, but frankly, it happened so quickly. Uh, and one of the things we've learned now, and kind of going back uh, in, this, uh, in this process to ask the Weather Service, what was unique about this storm? In fact, um, I mentioned this last week to, to the group, the, uh, the men's group. Uh, when I went to leave to come into the operations center, my wife said to me, Sandy, she said, when, when will you be home? And I said, honestly, I'm not sure. I've never seen a storm like this on the radar. It just kept getting bigger and bigger. We later learned that's called a backbuilding thunderstorm. And the National Weather Service is still trying to understand really what causes a backbuilding thunderstorm. Uh, beyond the meteorological challenges of kind of, of, of forecasting, we're tied in very, very tightly with the National Weather Service in Sterling, is the geography around Ellicott City. Uh, uh, the steep slopes around Ellicott City are, are unique, and they make it very difficult uh, uh, to give much advance warning when you don't know what's coming. Uh, from a meteorologic standpoint. And then the last piece is we're now learning that the technological, uh, the technology for that kind of geography, for that kind of storm is, is only now being developed. Uh, so uh, we've been working with the uh, uh, stormwater management team uh, to look at ways that we might be able to upgrade some of the technology in the watershed. One, to collect the data so we can better understand what different scenarios are going to mean. Uh, but also uh, give ourselves as much lead time as possible. And if I can also say, uh, the executive uh, immediately after the storm uh, set in motion a process, a master planning process that's going on right now. So all of you are invited in to be part of that process as well. But in doing so, they did a complete map of the watershed, the Ellicott City watershed, uh, down to a one square meter grid. So that the goal is we take the data now that we know about the watershed and overlay what we're going to learn about these kinds of storms and then put the technology around the watershed. Uh, and those three elements combined will give us, uh, our goal is to give us the most, uh, the, the longest lead time to get people out of harm's way. So, uh, but I'd love to talk to you offline a little bit more about some of those, some of those timestamps because we actually did collect all of it in detail. Mm -hmm. well, I guess. 
I didn't mean you to go in all the technical thing because I do understand a lot how complicated and what a unique watershed it is. It was more that the police department didn't tweet until 11.01. That, so I don't know who, or retweet anything about, stay away from a lot of places apparently would have been a good idea. Um, Font Hill and, and, and if you're in a low-lying area near uh, Centennial. No. Um, well, we, we appreciate that. I so think it, uh, it, it's just that with so many other incidents, they do such a great job of every few minutes updating whether the road's still closed. And it just seemed that when you have the biggest thing, you didn't do that. So I've been trying to find out for a year plus now whether that's one of the things you're going to pay more attention well, to I'll that. And, and why don't you use the emergency cable system when there is an emergency, I get... Uh, How about afterwards, I'll give you some more information. Yeah, okay. Great. Thank you, Joel. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, but I, I will tell you, I, do you want to come up pastor next? Just, you can come up, we'll come up forward so I can hear you. Hey, I know you're a pastor, we can hear you all the time, but you need to come forward. But as you come forward, I just want to tell you folks... I have the pastor's voice. No, nah, that's okay, but as you come forward, I want folks to know that, um, that I do believe that our folks did a great job with the recovery response response and recovery of Ellicott City. Um, and I know we can get better. And we have an action, after action report that we're working on. And that's what Ryan was talking about. And it's pages and pages and pages. Uh, but I will tell you, from talking to experts from around the country, uh, they really felt like what we have done is almost like a case study of the way things should have to be done. And a lot of folks up here are because are the reason that happened. And a lot of folks in the community. So, you know, continue to go down to Ellicott City. They're having some of their best year ever. And it's because all of you have continued to support them. And it, there are some amazing people in Ellicott City. What we learned in Ellicott City was the resiliency of Howard County is, is tremendous. So, so yep, yeah, Pastor. That's all right. This is more, not so much of a question, but this is more of a, just a statement to you all. County Zach, very good friend, and to Chief Garner, and to the Sheriff, and all each and every one of you all. We want you to know, as, as one of the clergy that's in the Howard County area, I want to also let the community know that, that the clergy and the church is available as well that we partner in with each and every one of you. And you know, because it's someone that may need to have some spiritual advising more so than they could. They may be needing to reach out uh, for spiritual uh, as well as just sort of, you know, anyone can have, uh, get the medical uh, piece of it, but then they also may need spiritual. We want you to know that as it is, the church is here, as you all know, that full gospel on, on, on Cooksville. In Cooksville and at uh, 144 we are there for the community anytime it needs to be any town me anything that needs to happen that we would like to be a part of it um, as County Zegno and Chief Garner and we want you to know and to the correctional to Mr. Jack we are there we've been a part of it as I have been a part of uh, Howard County Detention Center not long uh, coming for spiritual but I have been coming to uh, going to Howard County Detention Center since 1991 and to uh, to different and all of the other correctional club uh, Maryland house for men and women Jessup I have been involved in all of them so we just want you to know that we're there trying to mentally uh, spiritually help out uh, the men and women uh, we're trying to get from this state to another but the church is there we want you to know that thank you Pastor okay? Davis and we look forward to having Chief Butler and all you all to come out and come out and uh, to full gospel and we want to set up through um, one of my trustees uh, sister uh, Gladys Staten who be advising this or working with this Great. of coming out to get some training on, on what we can do thank you. in helping out because we don't never know who's going to come to the house of God and come on the steps needing some help and we want to be able to do that. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Pastor Davis. I appreciate it. Full Gospel Baptist Church, right on 144 in Cooksville. It's a great place. Um, Can I just say yeah. something? So sure. thank, thank you for that. Um, and um, as part of our outreach, we have actually, and I'm, we meaning the collective, different folks, um, actually, uh, if we are hosted, and we recently were hosted uh, at another faith-based organization in Howard County on a Saturday morning, for their parishioners to hear about uh, opioid or whatever the issue that we we will be there for you so just reach out to us and uh, because I think 
We'd like to be able to provide more than just the naloxone um, education and other information so that as I think someone so poignantly said, we don't have to use the naloxone. So um, I'm going to try to find a card so I can give it to you. Good, great. I think the chief wants to say something. Pastor, um, I enjoyed visiting with your church. After, um, when we break, I'd like to um, talk to you a little bit about a stress, uh, stress first aid program we have going on. We'll put some people with it. Sounds wonderful. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone else have a comment or a question? Uh, there is one topic I thought we should hit on that, that we have brought up is human trafficking and, and what we've been doing on that. I know that the state attorney has been involved, please, but if you want to talk a little bit yes. about that. Can Thank you. Uh, so our office has prosecutors that are devoted to specializing in the prosecution of human trafficking cases. And the past year, a number of people in the community have come up to myself and others in our office and said we can't believe we have human trafficking in Howard County where is that coming from where is it happening um, human traffickers are very attracted to Howard County for a number of reasons but the most ironic one is the safety of Howard County is nationally known and human traffickers believe that bringing their victims to Howard County for the purpose of prostitution is a safe place for them it's safe that you know, they don't have to worry about getting robbed and ripped off by drug dealers or other human traffickers. Um, Howard County is also attractive to human traffickers because of its location along uh, 95, Interstate 70. We've got the Route 1 corridor with a lot of uh, establishments that are the right place for human traffickers to bring their victims. Um, oftentimes the victims are very vulnerable. They're addicts. They are foster children. They're already in trouble. So they're preyed upon by human traffickers and they're often brought from other jurisdictions, sometimes even other states. But our prosecutors are so far ahead of the game in the prosecution of these cases that we have people from other jurisdictions, other prosecutors offices that are asking us to train them. How do you put a case together? They're difficult to prosecute because we have to assume from the very beginning that we are not gonna have that victim with us for a testimony, whether it's because they don't want to cooperate, um, they don't want to testify against this person, or because they're gone by the time the case comes around to court. They are back on the streets, they're nowhere to be found. It's the lifestyle that they know. Uh, but we are, Howard County State's Attorney's Office, I believe we have put together and we prosecuted the very first human trafficking case without a victim that was done solely on cell phone evidence and other corroborating evidence that we were able to put together along with the uh, vice detectives that work incredibly closely with the victims. I would also just point out that similar to domestic violence, human trafficking victims, they come first when the case comes through our office. Um, we don't immediately start looking towards trial, court appearances, and testimony prep. The very first concern of the human trafficking prosecutors and our domestic violence prosecutors is what does that victim need? Is that victim safe? And if our prosecutors, our victim advocates, and the vice detectives, if that means that they are going to a hospital, to a treatment facility to meet with the victim late at night, and that's what they do. Um, that victim comes, comes first, and what can we do to keep that person safe? Um, but we have had significant success in the courtroom with obtaining uh, strong, serious sentences from the courts. The courts do not take kindly to human traffickers in Howard County. Similar to child abusers, um, sexual offenders in Howard County, the judges impose very harsh sentences on human traffickers. There's a felony version of human trafficking and a misdemeanor version. When we've prosecuted the misdemeanor version, we've gotten the max, 10 years. Um, we've prosecuted the felony version, we've gotten 50 plus years. It's going to depend on the facts of each case, but the courts are certainly coming down hard on human traffickers and we want to try to take Howard County off of their, their route, off of their map along the East Coast and stop bringing the victims here. Um, so that's what we're okay. doing at the moment. Great, thank you very much. I know I'd like to ask Chief Gardner too, because we've had some recent legislation that passed the state to allow them to have some more tools and also we've hired, given them more resources to the police department as well. So if you could share, come on. Thank you. Uh, yes, we, under the uh, 
the county executive, we actually have increased our staff. We have two full-time detectives now devoted to human trafficking under uh, one supervisor, uh, and that's worked out very well. Uh, as Kim mentioned, Howard County is uh, ripe for this uh, type of crime, the location where we are. But we see things not only in the hotels, and I mentioned earlier about the eyes and ears of the community so important in this. We actually had a case, international case, in which uh, women, well, first of all, uh, in a condominium uh, area, now we're finding where people go into private residences uh, conducting this business, in which people reported suspicious activity, actually thinking that it may have been drug activity at the time. Uh, but what it ended up being is three women from China who had been brought in for the purpose of human trafficking, uh, locked in rooms, locked in bedrooms, uh, and uh, being enslaved for the purpose of uh, sex uh, in, that, in a residential community in a condominium. But it was from the community actually making that report, thinking that it was something else, and turning out to be uh, human trafficking. So it's so important to having the eyes and ears out in the community. Uh, but one of the things that we just did recently was uh, we passed uh, legislation locally here in the county that allows us uh, to go into spas uh, and uh, upon demand uh, they must produce the uh, therapist, uh, the massage therapist license. Uh, and we have some uh, businesses here in the county uh, that we have been uh, on our radar, suspicious watching. Uh, and we've gone into uh, several now in which they were unable to. We report that and coordinate. There is one person in the state of Maryland that's responsible for that oversight. Uh, so we coordinate with that individual in an effort to get them closed down and out of the county. And we've been successful now in doing that in uh, three cases so far uh, this year. So that's worked out well for us. And we'll continue uh, to fight in that area. Uh, again, some of those cases being brought to our attention by businesses nearby reporting that type of suspicious activity. Great, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We also put together a forfeiture fund for that as well as we do with drug to get money. Because uh, again, the first thing in mind is how we help the victim. Uh, and that's always going to be the first thing in our mind, to make sure we can do what we can to provide them the services they need. Uh, I just can't imagine what it must be like. And so I can't imagine the type of person has to be there to help somebody who may be someone who doesn't speak English and is here and being treated so terribly. And we have to figure out how we can help them. Uh, and there are some organizations that we work with uh, in the state that help us do that. But, um, but that's something that's really big that we're going to continue to work really hard on. Does anyone else have any thoughts or any questions? Yes, yes, please come forward. I'm Lori Reamer. I work for Leadership Howard County, but I've also been living in the county for 30 years. I want to thank you all for lots of reasons, helping leadership and helping our county. Body cameras, just where are we on it? It's a difficult double-edged sword. I know that you guys have been looking at it. Can you give us an update? Sure, great. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Lori. Uh, actually, uh, Major Jones, one of our deputy chiefs who's here tonight with us, he's actually leading that project uh, in the police department. Uh, we started a pilot program uh, a few months ago. Uh, we're looking at two camera systems, uh, so we're running two pilot programs with ten officers. Uh, the first program has already been completed with Axon uh, cameras. Uh, that was a 45-day trial period with ten officers deployed. Uh, on day shift, night shift. Uh, that data has been collected now and we're in our second phase of the testing of a pilot uh, with another company, uh, Utility, and uh, that will be wrapping up in about a, a week, uh, about a week, and we'll have that second 45-day trial period. We have uh, a professor from Loyola who's also working with us uh, to uh, measure the uh, uh, effectiveness of the cameras and the impact of the camera with the officers uh, collecting that data. And then we'll have a report prepared probably at the end of uh, the end of the year that we'll get back uh, to the executive with the assessment uh, that we're doing. Uh, we've had all sorts of experiences. Actually, uh, most recently, uh, we learned in the second trial phase, uh, one of our officers was out directing traffic. A uh, car actually ran over his feet, uh, spun him around. Uh, he didn't actually see the vehicle. Uh, but the camera actually caught uh, the vehicle that hit him uh, and we were able to enhance that uh, camera uh, photograph and uh, actually identify the car and driver. So it has uh, produced some benefits. But 
Uh, that's still being assessed, and uh, we're wrapping that up and should be by the end of the year. Thank you for the question. I appreciate that. But you were sort of looking into it, and the state legislature has been dealing with this as well, because there's certainly a lot of privacy issues here. I mean, you got to deal with an awful lot of issues, privacy not just of residents, but privacy of police officers. Uh, and we have to make sure how we can best deal with that, because uh, you know, we want to make sure that we do something that's effective, um, but also something that respects uh, the people involved. And that's, that's, not, that's tough. That's tough. Um, so we're working on it. But, but I appreciate the police department is taking it very seriously. As you said, they're, they're on their, they almost finished their second pilot. So this is something that we're taking very seriously. And after we get all the information together, we'll make the final decision on whether we want to go that way or not. Okay. Anybody else? I know what time is. I don't have a watch on. Are we OK time-wise? Oh, well, it's almost time to end anyway. So, um, but if any, any last questions, I, I will tell you, I couldn't be more proud of the folks that are standing up, sitting up here and, and speaking with us tonight. I mean, we're very, very fortunate in Howard County to have them. Uh, when, I, when I think about, yeah, I just give them a question. When I was elected county executive and, you know, you, you get into office and you're thinking, okay, what am I going to do? And then you have the people who serve us and who uh, lead our departments. And I can tell you right now, uh, they are so good, and this is, I'll give some credit to the prior administration. Almost everybody up here is from the prior administration. And I think that's important when you have leaders come in and say, you don't just throw people out because you're a new person. You, you look and see if we have good people here, why not keep them? And I can tell you, Jack was there. Well, Bill was the chief of police at the time, but now he's a sheriff, which is great. Uh, well, he was chief of police right before I got here. And then Gary Gardner was here before. Kim, of course, was here. Mara was here. Ryan was here. He was in the, 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 in the fire department, but uh, with the new fire chief, we, we brought him up. And actually, John, John Butler is the very first fire chief, I think, in the history of Howard County that came through the ranks. He came through from the very low all the way up now to the chief of the fire department, which I think says an awful lot uh, about our community because you know, these are the folks that are face, these are the folks people deal with. And uh, I guess to tell you right now, they have all my respect and all my trust, and, and I can't be happier than to have them here. So. I thank you for being here tonight. If you have any other questions, I'm sure anybody would be willing to talk to. A few people are sick, so if you don't mind, let them go home. Uh, but have a great evening. Thanks for coming out.